Enga waka, enga mana, enga reo, tēnā koutou. E te mano hiri, enga ho mahi, e rao rangatira mā, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko hui hui mai ki te tautoko i tēnē whakahirihira. Nō reira, haere mai koutou, haere mai koutou katoa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neil Quigley. I'm the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Waikato. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this inaugural lecture uh, by Professor Catherine Pavlovich. Inaugural lectures are a very important part of the university tradition. Uh, they mark what is a very important milestone uh, in the career of an academic. Relatively few of our staff members are appointed at professorial level or promoted uh, to professor and their appointment to or promotion to that position always signals a very significant research contribution. That's important to the university because of course it is our contribution to research that marks universities from other tertiary institutions and which is the primary driver of our international um, uh, standing as a university. So thank you uh, for coming this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, helping to celebrate uh, Catherine's appointment as a professor. Uh, it's now uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the Dean of the Wakaro Management School, Professor Don Ross, uh, to make a few introductory remarks for Catherine's lecture. Don, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Kathleen, Catherine Pavlich to you this evening. Professor Pavlich is a futurist, and her teaching and research explores new forms of organizing for developing human flourishing in a post capitalist world. These new forms of organizing begin with the development of eye technologies that include mindfulness, empathy, and reflexivity to better understand mutually co constructed environments. And this perspective is evident in her teaching and research on leadership and entrepreneurship. Naturally, uh, as someone who the university has seen fit to promote to Professor, Professor Pavlich has an extensive CV, and we could not begin to review all of it or even much of it this evening. I will just uh, direct attention to a few of its highlights. She has authored over 80 academic papers, 30 of these appearing in international refereed journals. Uh, she has recent publications in such uh, world-leading journals as Tourism Management, the Journal of Business Ethics, and the Journal of, of Business Venturing. She, uh, her teach, her, her, sorry. She's the co-editor of the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. She's guest edited the, uh, an edition of the Australasian Entrepreneurship Journal of Management and Organization. She's currently on the executive committee of the Academy of Management. This is a five-year, this is a five-year, ten-year leading, one of 24 divisions of interest groups at the Academy. It's a leading professional association for scholars dedicated to creating and disseminating knowledge about management and organization and it's one of the oldest and largest scholarly management associations in the world. So, a distinguished range of scholarly accomplishments, a distinguished publishing career, a distinguished research administrative career with global dimensions. She brings great distinction to the, school, to the Waikato School of Management and to the University of Waikato. She has an interesting and unique research expertise, corner of research expertise, and uh, we, I very much look forward to hearing her remarks this evening. Congratulations, Professor Pavlich. I give you Professor Pavlich.
thousand years ago. Yet we have succeeded in disrupting the balance that is so essential to life. by the statement, we have the power to change, but what are we late waiting for? This implies a shift in our understanding of leadership. It's no longer this heroic leader at the top of the hierarchy that says, come follow me, and the followers follow on. We're talking about a gentle leadership that resides in each and every one of us, knowing that our actions do make a difference. This implies a shift in our understanding and awareness of our responsibilities and that what we do matters. So this means asking those big existential questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Not purpose as in treasure, the batch, the boat and the beamer, but purpose is in our legend. What do we want to be known for? What do we get up for in the morning? What is it that inspires us that would even die for if we needed to? That sense of purpose. This means no longer living in a bubble as if somehow we are here and we're disconnected from out there. It means folding back our inner landscape and looking at our own interior. Now this is more than self-awareness. This is self-awareness and other awareness, and mostly that space in between. This is what I'm going to talk about today. Now one of my students, Ravi, wrote a poem on this, but I don't think he's here, so I'll read it for him. Work is now cogs struggle to turn, the corporate machine, your money they burn. Hope is now frail for those who live behind the veil, but alas, on wings does the new-born leader soar and sail. For workers now brothers thrive and learn, and the corporate machine keeps the earth clean. Through the new conscious leader's vision, once again our earth will glean. So this old story, where man was on top of this hierarchy, created a world of separation between self and other. It's an extractive economy where we don't have responsibility for those border actions. It's a world of winners and losers. However, I do believe we're writing a new story. We're in the middle of this great big shift. We are interdependent. We are dynamic. We have a deep ecological way of actually seeing the world. It is participatory, and it's about a collective consciousness. So let me give you some examples of what's happening. Crowdfunding is a starting point. The Green Foundation, which set out to give loans to those at the bottom of the pyramid, those loans have been returned by 99.17% of people. So just because you're poor, it doesn't mean you're not going to be honourable and repay. The Kiva set up by Jessica Jackley when she was in her mid-twenties. All of us can just give $20 that changes somebody's way of living. Our own Give a Little here in New Zealand 
$27 million has been given to that, and nearly $4 million in the past 30 days. And of course we've got our own social innovation students here at Waikato that are prepared to do good work. Something big is happening. It's also... Thank you. So something big is happening. And even in the world of entrepreneurship, we're starting to see a significant shift. These backpacks that have got solar panels on them, so these kids can go home and do homework when they don't have any electricity. I'm not sure what my students use as, as an excuse. 450 babies die every hour because they're born in impoverished conditions. There's innovation around incubators. $20,000 for an incubator, I mean, that's just, we can't do that. And so there's a lot of innovation creating these small baby backpacks. And there's even some here in New Zealand as well that are being developed. Kibosh, a different way of using food. They go around and they collect food that's no longer being used and give it to those that actually need. Or in Italy, if you can't pay your water bill, you can actually pay it through good deeds. Something big is happening, where that gap between self and other starts to close, when we want to do these good works just to help those that are less well off than ourselves. They understand we have the power to change. They are not waiting. I am a management educator. My purpose is to help my students understand what's it's, what it's like to live in a biocentric engagement, knowing what they do matters, knowing that they live in an interdependent, interdependent complex environment, that they leave my care and those of the rest of us being ethical and socially conscious, and knowing that there are ripple effects for what they do. Now, of course, I've been talking about these things for quite a long time. Some people call me weird. And when I asked to develop a course on spirituality in the business school, people said, what? But the university did say yes, and globally we were seen as a world leader for making that shift. The interesting things now is that this is mainstream, according to the Huffington Post. You're probably part of it. I call it the consciousness crowd. So what I'm going to present to you today is just a slice of my research around that self-other relationship. I'm calling this noetic wisdom. It comes from the Greek word noesis, which means inner wisdom, direct knowing. It's about our own subjective experience, but within an interconnected global world. William James calls this a metaphysical quality because it involves self and other. And there is this aspect of transcendence as well. I first came across this idea of noetic when I went to a spirit and business conference in San Francisco about 15 years ago. And I heard of the noetic Institute of Noetic Sciences. This was set up by Captain Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. And he commented that when he was flying back to the Earth, he would look out the window and it was a sense of such profoundness and awe, and he would just start to cry and cry and cry. He couldn't explain it. But he knew that the science and the reality that he'd been growing up with was not the full story. That the molecules in his body were actually constructed of those in the past, the present, and would go on in the future. 
And so he came back to Earth and he set up the Institute of Noetic Sciences to look at that relationship between science, spirituality, and consciousness. And for some strange reason, I was always drawn to that. And they also had this much bigger network of people, like 10, 20,000 people, so there's always some interesting research to look at. I did get the opportunity to med meet Edgar, and it say it's like touching stardust. Before I go on to talk about my research and my contributions around this noetic way of looking, I just want to try an activity with you. I want you to think of someone who brought out the best in you. What did they do and how did they make you feel? And if I gave you some time, you'd probably come up with comments like this. They excited and empowered you. They were fun to being round. They helped you understand the bigger picture and gave you meaning in life. How did you feel? You felt lighter. You felt relaxed and you were engaged in some forms of laughter, whatever they were. If I asked you the opposite, think of someone who brought out the worst in you, you'd probably come up with comments like this. They were micromanagers. They blamed others. Yeah, you get, you get it. You don't need me to read this. Okay, you know. So when you're with someone that's making you feel good, you're feeling bigger. When you're with someone that's not making you feel good, you're closing down. And so we have some physiological evidence while living in the good actually is a good thing to do. A biology, a biology cast here. So when we're feeling bigger, our parasympathetic nervous system is being activated. Our blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes down, and our pulse rate goes down. It means that our immune system is being activated to its full ability. On the other hand, when you're closing down, your sympathetic system is being activated. That means your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, and your pulse rate goes up. This has significant effects for leadership. So now we understand, I hope, physiological effects. We also have psychological effects of feeling good like this. Barbara Fredrickson came up with this idea of broaden and build through positive emotions. So when we're looking at this noetic wisdom, we're looking at these qualities such as gratitude, humility, courage, compassion. And what they do is broaden our scope of awareness. So actually we have a bigger view of life. If we're a leader, we can make better decisions because we've got a broader scope of, of information that's coming in. We also have a better focus of attention. They are significant shifts in our understanding of what leadership can be about. And secondly, it builds our own inner resources, so we can become more resilient in times when we need that resilience to overcome some difficulties. So we've got physiological evidence and now psychological evidence why living in the good is better for us and contributes to human flourishing. One of the things I do in the classroom is I get my students to do artwork. I hope my economist friends are okay with that. <laughs> this particular piece of artwork was a hand-blown glass dragon. Can you imagine that? And he talked about symbolising it's a dragon, so it's fierce, but it's not real. And he made the connection with his own mind monsters. They're equally fierce, but not real. And so the question, we all have the power to change, so what are we waiting for? It's about shifting those mind monsters into the positive. That is what I'll talk about now. 
And so I've come up with a framework around I technologies, which is I, and the technologies of self, that involve mindfulness, reflexivity, and empathy. And this conceptualization that I did pull together did get me uh, a best paper award at the Australia New Zealand Academy of Management last year. So we'll start with mindfulness. As I said, it's a new hot topic now. Time Magazine, Scientific American, Newsweek, they're all talking about mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Well, we all know what this is like. <sighs> but what we need to be hopefully aiming for, and I really like this photo, because it's a reminder to myself when my mind is really full, just to be quiet and serene. No matter what is going on around us, which of course, as you know, is really difficult. The folks at the Centre for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, which is Harvard, have come up with a mindfulness training program. They put people through a 40 minute a day walking meditation, sitting meditation, and half a yoga program for eight weeks. I'm only showing you two of their quite significant results. Okay, so you can see the blue, the control group, versus the red, which is those that have gone through the program. There is a significant difference here. After eight weeks, this is the effect on the left hippocampus, which is where learning and memory is located. Okay, so meditate for 40 minutes a day, guys, and you'll have a great increased brain plasticity. You'll also regulate your emotions, so you become a better leader in that you don't rush into things before thinking them through. The second one I want to show you, similar results, quite significant results. The Tempo Pareto Junction. That's where that broader perspective taking takes place. And you have greater empathy and passion, compassion. That is significant for this bridging of the self-other relationship. So we now have physiological evidence, psychological evidence, and neuroimaging, neuroscience evidence to show us that living in the good actually does matter. It can produce different types of leaders, people that act, people that know their responsibilities for a broader world, people that understand that the impacts of these clothes might have on the people making them, and that there are human rights issues being addressed. People that understand what's in our food, Subway sandwiches. People that understand what's happening in our environment. One of the surprising outcomes was it was the yoga that seemed to make the most impact on this, and no one expected that. And I think that was because yoga is such an action-based activity, so it just helps quite in the mind. And I can see some puzzled faces here. No, that's not me. So what am I doing about it? Well, I've developed a technique for my students to learn, developed through, write, through reflective journal writing. And as you can see, there have been a few publications there. 2007, uh, the, this technique has also got more complex but it's also become a lot simpler. This was picked up by the Open University in Australia with 3,000 students a year through this, and they put them through this program. So now and again, I do get emails from students that have gone through this saying, wow, I found it really helpful. So I ask my students, it's really simple, the head, the heart, the hand. The head, describe a situation that you had. What happened? Simple, hard part, the heart. How did you feel? The boys hate this. 
What emotions did you feel? Just identify a couple. Go down. What does that mean? Where did you feel it in your body? Can't talk. Oh, feel sick. I mean, there's a lot of signs that we get from feeling it in our body. And of course, the hands. What are you going to do to change the situation in the future? The trick is, after they leave me, that they know about the head, heart, and the hand, but they can identify it as the heart, the head, and the hand, which means I'm knowing myself better. Where, is it, where am I feeling this in my body? Whoops, make sense of it and do the change. So being mindful means becoming more of a witness of ourselves without rushing in boots and all. Better decisions from leaders. It also means we have a different relationship with things and we're less judgmental. So that is a shift in the way we understand the world. So the reality is most of us don't have 40 minutes a day to sit down and meditate, even though I know the stuff. But just taking a few minutes every day does matter. After all, we look after our bodies. When do we take time out to look after our brains and our minds? It's really important. The second concept I want to talk about is this notion of reflexivity. Now my colleague Anne Cunliffe, who is, she is the 50th year distinguished professor appointment at Bradford, she's come up with this framework which is about it, I and we. I've changed it into pretty pictures here. But it, the stuff out there, you know, the, the building, you all know that. I. Where do I sit? This notion of being reflective, journaling. But the thing we forget is this idea of we, that space between us. How do we reframe that? Because as we become less judgmental that, and have a different relationship with things, that starts to change. And so she and I have both got a real strong interest in using art in the classroom to create these reflexive students who know about this relationship between I and we. I included this peacock. That took 1,100 pieces of A4 paper. It took her nearly 20 hours to do. That's pretty stunning. And she talked about needing to learn the virtue of patience, mindfulness, and she metaphorically spoke about her journey of self-actualization, which of course was like the peacock. I digress. What Anne and I have done is identified three practices that engaging in art does. This is about performing art, which means we no longer just have our cognitive abilities in place, like an academic text, but we have our full self have our emotional self, our spiritual self. We bring everything together. And so we identified three aspects that doing art does. First of all, it challenges, it triggers awareness. So this student did this board identifying her strengths and weaknesses. And it surfaces what's often not apparent. And so she talked about seeing her weaknesses and wanting to rip them out. Whereas doing this artwork enabled her to say, I can embrace this, this is who I am, and work with it in a different way. This notion of embodiment, where do you feel it in the body? And a lot of those students talk about, actually a number of them talk about being involved in teamwork and feeling that what they have to say doesn't matter, and how it clutches up the stomach and does things to them. So it's about being aware of, of those different aspects in the body. Secondly, it challenges assumptions. And we've got these masks that stu students draw. In terms of which, which self is it that I'm presenting? 
and also allows us to use multiple voices. When they're doing art, they can be somebody else and feel what it's like being in that space of the other. And finally, transforming. This notion of curiosity, and she's here popping out of the, the box saying that instead of being judgmental, which is what she thought she was, she's able to be curious in that way around her. So this is about changing our mindset and the way we look at the self-other world. Not being judgmental, driving down the road, getting really cross at someone that's really slow. Instead of being cross, twisting it around to say, I wonder what's happened in their life that they're really upset and need to drive so slow. It's about having a different mindset. The third one I want to talk about is empathy. This dear wee soul is my granddaughter. And so I can hear and see happy faces here. Isn't she beautiful? We can immediately feel that effective emotional empathy and we're making sense of it so we understand cognitive empathy as well which is what the literature talks about. But what I'm positing is there is actually a third part of empathy. And let me show you this. This dear wee soul, only after a couple of hours after this photo was taken, was in hospital having serious surgery. So many of you will feel something. And I'm not sure, but I could feel there was a shift in energy here. I know some of you would have felt it as well. So there are two things that might help explain this. The first one is this idea of mirror neurons. Ten years ago, the neuroscientists discovered, well, sorry, identified, they didn't discover, identified these things called mirror neurons, which means the same neural pathways in the brain are activated whether we're having that experience or whether we're observing that experience happening. How can that be? The neuroscientists say that these mirror neurons mediate our capacity to share with others. So what we're suggesting, if there is this sharing going on, how can that happen? So I'm suggesting that at the quantum level, we are connected through that deep interconnection, that deep empathy. And in feeling another's pain and joy, it becomes our own, forming an interconnected confluence. That has significant shift in this idea of a collective consciousness and how there are so many people wanting to help the other in some way. We understand that at the atomic level, the world is made up of particles. But at the subatomic level, we know they are waves as well. So information is being passed through waves. Have any of you suddenly thought of someone that you haven't seen or heard from a long time? and suddenly you see them or they phone you up. How can we explain that? I think most of us have had that experience. It could be that that information is being changed, flowed through at that subatomic level. Okay, this might be really weird for some people, but I do believe that this idea of quantum empathy can help us explain this shift between more, and this changing this relationship between self and other. Interestingly enough, uh, Don talked about my role at the Academy of Management. This has 10,000 international delegates at their conference every year. And I did get a best paper award for this strange idea. 
And out of that, several things happened. One was I did get invited from that best paper to be on the leadership committee for this particular division at the academy. Second, we were invited by Routledge to write a book on this particular topic. Those of you that are academic know that Routledge is one of our top academic publishers. And thirdly, we got it into an A journal, the Journal of Business Ethics. This paper has been quite well cited without being despite being weird, and in a wide variety of journals, clearly the management ethics journals, but also design thinking, uh, Man Academy of Management Perspectives, which was one of our top journals, um, even a neuroscience journal, and a medical journal. How can that be? All good stuff. So we're just trying to challenge the way that we think about this I-other relationship. And we can start to see that collective consciousness being played out in so many environments. Slash tag, I'll ride with you, that happened after the event in Sydney. People want to show that they care. And there have been so many other examples around this shift in the way that we see the other. Many of you might be saying, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. What's this got to do with business? So I put together a research project interviewing 15 leaders slash entrepreneurs around the globe. And I particularly focused on something that was quite extreme. These people have all moved to emerging economies solely solely to help alleviate poverty. These are not social enterprises. These are social business. They have to make a profit to stay in business to fulfill their purpose. Here is one uh, yoga wear clothing, which started off as yoga clothing, but then moved into leisure clothing. She spends six months a year in Bali working this, with those people to try and make organic cotton mainstream. She says, to me, the inspiration is not about making money. I want to be part of normalizing a more ethical and conscious form of business. Here's one of my favorites, free set. Again, it's a Auckland couple. He said he used to roam the streets of Auckland and says, I need to move somewhere else to really make a difference. So his wife, himself, and their four young children moved to Calcutta. They rented a house, and in the middle of the night, they understood they were in the middle of the largest red light district. So he knew what his purpose was. It's around changing the system for some women, creating freedom. So he set up a textile business. He said, mostly you would employ people in a business like mine based on how good their sewing skills are. But he employs these women based on their need for freedom and, and changing cycles. And he said, some of them are hopeless at sewing, and they cost us a fortune. When you engage with poverty, he says, something changes about you. And he talks about humility is the greatest thing. When your selfishness rules, you can't see it because you tend to go after stuff that doesn't count. Rain Africa, the most beautiful bath and body products, which unfortunately we can't get in New Zealand. Made in South Africa, all handmade. The same story. She wants to change the system for people that are virtually unemployable in her, hand, in her land. It's not about profit. It's about making a positive difference to other people's lives, educating them, medical care, giving them hope. My final business example is one of my roles as at the Academy of Management last year was to organize the plenary session. So I decided to be really cheeky. And I decided to ask some really top strategy guys like Jay Barney and Otto Sharma, not expecting them to say yes. And they said yes. They talked about their own spirituality. 
and how that shaped their business, their academic careers. They also agreed to let that talk to be published in a C journal, which is kind of pretty cool, showing their own shift in awareness and consciousness. Jay said he could never say this in corporate America, but he said, the reason my, many of my leaders are successful is because they love their people. What does that sound like? I'm going to leave the final words to my students, or sorry, my ex-students, because often as management educators, we don't really understand the impact that we do make on them. But for some of them, we do sow seeds, and it does make a difference. Last year, I was at the Sustainable Network Awards, and one of my ex-students came up to me, Sarah, and we started to chat. The next day, on Facebook, I see that. I mean, I was really quite surprised, but yeah. The second slide you won't be able to read. Don't try. I just wanted to pop it there to show you I'm not making it up. But a, few, a month or two ago, I got this email out of the blue from a student who was mine in 2010. And she talked about being a cynic in my class. I didn't know that. Usually I can pick it up, but I didn't know that with her. She was very career-focused and wanted to work for you know, a really high-powered corporate, which she did. And she emailed to he me here to say what a challenging experience it was. She's now in a different business environment, and she thinks about my course all the time and tries to put in place what she learned. So that's kind of cool that someone that was quite cynical actually went into business and did start to make a difference as well. My final student is another ex-student who's going to pop up here and say a few words. Yes. Gemma. Um, investigating and applying the ideas previously mentioned has had a significant impact on my leadership and perspectives in business. I feel awakened to the interconnectivity that exists not just in business, but in the everyday life. I feel a greater sense of responsibility now I know what I do to seek more than turn a profit. I feel more fulfilled as I interact with people better understanding, self-awareness, and the intersubjective space between myself and others. My focus has shifted from profit maximization to conscious and purposeful engagement, and my dream of being a highly successful businesswoman now means engaging and connecting in business to make a profound difference, not necessarily having a highly profitable enterprise. Thank you. So, in conclusion, I hope you agree, we are in the middle of a big shift, a shift in consciousness, a noetic way that helps us bridge that relationship between self and other. My research contributions are developing an ontological shift in mindset in the way we see the world. This is not just about self-awareness, this is much bigger than that. It's a reframing of who we are we all have the power to change. Being conscious means we're not waiting for others. And so I also developed theoretical frameworks that people can actually put into practice. The heart, the head and hand, quite simple. And practice examples of organizations that actually are part of this big shift in a practice way. So I'd just like to conclude Thank you. Uh, my name is Alistair Jones, and it's my pleasure this evening to thank Catherine for her inaugural uh, professorial lecture and giving us.
us some insights uh, both into her research and to her teaching approaches and how we also might uh, view the world differently. Uh, mixing uh, psychological and physiological aspects uh, in, le in leadership and the difference that that can make, um, particularly around mindfulness, um, reflexivity and empathy and the way that um, we can organise and manage ourselves differently to make a difference. So it's my real pleasure now to uh, reiterate and, and thank Catherine very much for her uh, inaugural lecture. Thank you very much.